church fam. Welcome to Harvester Christian Church. So glad that you're here. If you're online watching, glad that you're here as well. Let us know that you're here. If you're here online, let us know if you're here in person by raising your hand. Good, you know where you are then. Hey, grab your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 15. We are in a series, we are studying the life of Abraham, a guy who has quite the story, and we are in week three of that story, which brings us to Genesis chapter 15. If you are just jumping online with us or just jumping in for this service, I highly recommend going back and listening to, the, whether it be on YouTube or the podcast, of the first two weeks, because Abraham's story builds as we go. We get to see in his stories really some moments where he does some incredible things, and then some other moments like we saw last week where he just does some really dumb things as well. And that really is the pattern of his story. Faith and then wavering of faith. Faith and then wavering of faith. Last week we saw him waver in his faith and then he came back to God. And we're not gonna cover chapter 14, but Abraham has this incredible story that happens in 14 where he wins this incredible battle. And now we're gonna get to chapter 15 where once again, it looks like, his faith is wavering. But something interesting happens in chapter 15 that I wanna point out today. And it's a thing called a covenant. A covenant happens in chapter 15. Now, in our Western culture, we don't talk a lot about covenants, do we? Uh, what we talk about is promises. We're more familiar with promises. In fact, um, if you grew up in high school, you know what promises are about. Um, real quick question, and I want honesty here. Had, did anybody ever receive or give a promise ring in high school? Oh, look at that love. That's high school love right there. Did any of those turn out well or work out for you? All right, one of those people. Good for you. That's great. I remember um, promise rings, if you don't know, that's what um, a desperate guy gives a girl to make sure that she doesn't break up with him. That's what a promise ring is. No, I really do love you. Here's a ring that proves it. And that ring is usually from the bubblegum machine at the bowling alley. That's what it is. And essentially what the promise ring does is it says, I'm not asking you to marry me, but someday I promise that I may ask you to marry me. And so we're really in the same spot that we were to begin with. What we don't know a lot about though is covenants. We're people who like to make promises, but we don't really like to lean onto covenants because covenants are a bigger deal. Can I tell you this? An engagement ring is a much bigger deal than a promise ring because an engagement ring comes with more definition to it. It's more than just a promise. A covenant in the ancient world is similar to what in the modern world we would call a contract or a treaty or a will. It establishes the basis of a relationship, but then it also establishes alongside of it conditions for the relationship and then also consequences for the relationship. If you break a promise ring promise, there's very little consequences except for late night tears and watching of the movie of 10 Things I Hate About You or the, the rom-com stuff. That's the consequences of it. But in a marriage, there's other consequences if those conditions aren't met. And so what we see in Genesis chapter 15 is Abraham's promise turning into a covenant. And this is important. And it's often a chapter that we read through because the stuff on each side of it is seemingly more interesting on the surface, but something important happens in Genesis chapter 15. Well, like I told you, Abraham, he's coming off this, this mountaintop experience where he wins this battle and he rescues Lot from the hands of the enemy and he returns Lot back to his land and all of a sudden, Abraham begins to think about the promises that God has made to him. And in verse one to verse five, it says this. It says, after these things, after this battle has been won by Abraham, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said this, fear not, Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus, who is his servant in his household. And Abram said, behold, you've given me no offspring and a member of my household, Eleazar, he's gonna be the one that's gonna be my heir. God, you say you're gonna be my protection. And you're right, you've protected me. 
But then you tell me that my reward shall be great? What use is a reward if I don't get to enjoy it or pass it down to my family? And essentially what he tells them is, God, I see a problem with your promise. The more I hear about this promise, I begin to realize that I'm not sure that it can come about. You say that I'm gonna have this great reward, but you've also told me to separate from my family and I have no kids either. And so Lot's gone, all, all the nephews and nieces, they live somewhere else now. Sarah and I, we're childless. I'm in my 80s, she's in her 70s, we have no kids. God, we are beyond the optimal situation to birth a child. And so all I can see is that it's obvious that Eliezer, my servant, he's gonna inherit any reward I get and it's gonna be his kids and their kids, not mine, who get to benefit from it. Verse four, God steps in and says, the word of the Lord came to him again. This man, Eliezer, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And God brought Abram outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. I think one of the things that we do that's similar to Abraham is that we evaluate God's promises by looking within ourselves, don't we? That's what Abraham was doing. He's saying, God, you gave me these promises, but as I look inside me, I'm disappointed. That's, that's what Abraham was experiencing. He, he couldn't figure out how this was gonna happen. He was trying to solve his problems by looking inside of himself. And when he looked inside of himself, when he looked at his situation, he came up empty. He came up incapable. He came up inadequate. And I think we do the same things when we hear about the promises of God. Some of you hear about the promise of God that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And there's this promise of forgiveness that is offered by God. And you're like, God, I love that promise, but when I look inside of me, and I consider the things that I have done, the ways that I've behaved, when I consider the feelings that I have, I come up empty and I'm not sure that you can fulfill that promise for me. God, I know that you've promised grace. I know that you've, you've promised that I can be free of addiction. But when I look inside of me, I come up inadequate and incapable when I look within, I don't see how that promise is possible, God. I heard someone once say this, when the outlook looks bleak, try looking up. When the outlook around you and within you looks bleak, the best thing you can do is look up. And that's what God does for Abraham in this moment. He says, Abraham, I know that you're questioning the promises right now, so here's what I want you to do. Follow me outside. He takes Abraham outside and he says, Abraham, you're looking a lot within. Here's what I want you to do. Look up. Look at the stars. Who's their father? Where did those come from? They came from nothing, and they came at the spoken word of the Lord. Abraham, point your eyes upward. Look what I'm capable of. You may look within and sense inadequacy, but don't forget that I am more than adequate. It's in that moment that something changes for Abraham. We read the very next verse and it says this, he believed the Lord and then God counted it to him as righteousness. In that moment, when he takes his eyes off of what's happening within and he looks with, without, something happens where he begins to believe the Lord, and then the God of the universe who created all the stars looks at him and points at him and says, righteousness. This is a foundational passage in the Old Testament, church. This is the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. In fact, this passage is quoted three times in the New Testament. It's quoted in Galatians chapter three, verse six. It's quoted in Romans chapter four, verse three. And then again in James chapter two, verse 23. And in every single instance, 
The authors of the New Testament point back to this passage here to point to the gateway when God opened up the door for humanity to receive not just riches, but righteousness. Abraham believed and righteousness was the result. The three words I wanna point out in this passage, the first word is this word believed. Abraham believed. Now, the Hebrew word for believe is a lot different than our word for believe. When we say believe, we really mean the word believe as in like a mental agreement or mental assent. Oh, yeah, mentally, I agree with you when you say that. I believe Jesus. I believe that he was probably a person. I believe what the scriptures say about him. But when the Hebrew word would use the word believe, it wasn't just mental activity and gymnastics, but it was a putting of your trust into. I believe, therefore I trust. I believe, therefore I put my weight into this. And so when Abraham stands before God and God says, look at the stars, look what I'm capable of. I'm capable of bringing an heir to you from your own flesh and blood. In that moment, Abraham not just believed in God, but he also got to this point where he says, I trust you. And from here on out, I'm going to walk as if that were true. He believed. And because of his belief, he was counted as righteous. This word righteous just means your stance before God. All of us have a stance before God. When you stand before God, whether it be your prayer times or your times of worship, how does God view you? When he looks at your heart, when he looks at your actions, when he looks at your history, when he looks at you and knows all things about you, the good that you've done, but also the bad that you've done and everything in between, what is your stance before God? I think a lot of us would probably land in a whole bunch of different areas, wouldn't we? Well, I'm guilty. Well, I'm a sinner. I'm a failure. I've done some good things, but I'm not as bad as that person. But I can't also say that I'm as good as what Jesus was either. Abraham stood before God. And it says, God looked at him and said, that's right. That's righteousness. Now, was it because of anything that Abraham did? Did he do anything specifically to earn righteousness? Did he sacrifice an animal in this moment? And God said, because you sacrificed that animal, now I'm going to count you righteous. Did he serve so many hours in his church? And God said, now that you've served that many hours in church, I count you as righteous. No. Did he give so much money to the church or to nonprofits? And God said, well, that's the right amount of number. So now you're righteous. Did he help a homeless person right before this? And God points back to that and says, now you're righteous. No, you know what God did? He counted it to him as righteous. This is an important word for us. Because a lot of us think that we have to earn righteousness when we stand before God. That maybe if I do the right thing, say the right thing in the right order, then God will consider me righteous. No. You know what we do? We trust in who he is, not who we are. We trust in who he is, not what we do. And when we put our faith in God, when we put our faith in Jesus, God does the work. God looks at you and points at you. God looked at Abraham and pointed at him and says, you're not righteous, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count it so. You're guilty, but I'm gonna count you as innocent. You're a sinner, but I'm gonna count you as a saint. And in this moment, Abraham inherits righteousness. Now, earlier in the passage, Abraham was confused because God said, I'm gonna be your protector and your reward will be great. You know what the reward that Abraham is gonna inherit is? It's not the riches of Egypt, it's righteousness. That's the inheritance. That's what Abraham needed most. He didn't need more money. He didn't need more livestock. What he needed, because of his wavering faith, just like ours, is he needed righteousness. This was his greatest need. And if you'll read the rest of the, the Old Testament and you get to see his children and the way they respond to God, their greatest need is righteousness as well. And then you get to the New Testament and you see how people respond to Jesus. Their greatest need is righteousness. And then you come to St. Louis, Missouri in 2023. And here's what we realize. Our greatest need to this day is still the righteousness of God. Because none of us stand before God as righteousness. We're all sinners who missed the mark. Abraham knew he was inadequate. 
to fulfill the promise of God. But now he believed that God was adequate. And so God, in this very moment, gives Abraham his reward that will be passed on from generation to generation, simply because he believed. And then God does something special in this moment. And this is the part of the story that we often overlook. What God does next in this moment is he cuts a covenant with Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verse seven through 10, this is what happens next. It says that God said to Abraham, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abraham said, still wavering in his faith, he says, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? You've promised it, but how am I to know? And the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, a partridge in a pear tree, a young pigeon, five golden rings. I think that's where Christmas came from right there. Christmas was born in that moment. No, God tells him, bring all these animals to me. I'm sorry, I'm off track. Uh, bring all these animals to me. And so Abraham brings them before the Lord. And then it says he brought all these and then he cut them in half and he laid each half over against the other. Now, we get lost in this because we don't quite understand what was happening here. What's happening here is that God is cutting a covenant with Abraham. Cutting a covenant was something that happened um, often in the day of Abraham. This wasn't an unusual ceremony and an unusual way of signing a covenant. And essentially what would happen is two people who wanted to make an agreement and wanted to cut a covenant would bring some animals together. And what they would do with those animals is they would cut them in half Oh, I felt your sadness in that moment. I felt your sadness. And they would lay them against each other separate from one another. And it wasn't just one. They brought a whole line of cute little animals apart and they would set them in this pathway. On the right side, there would be half of the animal. On the left side, the other half of the animal. And they would cut a covenant by making this agreement. So for example, if there was two kings who were fighting and warring against one another and they wanted to end the war, it wasn't enough for just one of them to say, you know what, I promise not to, to, to harm your people if you don't harm our people. The promise wasn't enough. And so what they would do is they would cut a covenant. They would cut some animals in half and then together, arm in arm, these kings would walk through the death way that they just created. And essentially what it was, was a symbol to one another, but both of their people that if any one of us breaks this covenant or any one of us turns to the left or the right of this covenant, they will become like these animals. That's the commitment we're making to one another. It's more than a promise. There, there's conditions to this. There's stipulations to this. And there's also consequences to breaking this covenant. And so when God, he calls Abraham to cut these animals in half, Abraham knows what's going on. He knows that God's getting ready to make a covenant with him. But something different happens. There's a significant difference that happens in this covenant. The passage goes on and says this. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Abraham, in the midst of doing this, he, it says he falls into this great sleep and in this sleep, he begins to get this vision and God shares a vision for the future of Abraham's heirs. He, he gives him a vision of what's gonna happen in Egypt and what's gonna happen in Pharaoh and the slavery they're gonna experience and how they're gonna come back to this land. And in the midst of explaining that, Abraham sees this vision of a smoking pot that passes through the pieces. And he sees this vision of a flaming torch that passes through these pieces. And Abraham would have known immediately that this is a symbol of God walking death's walkway. But notice what doesn't happen. Abraham doesn't walk with them. God walks it alone. When it came time to walk through these pieces, God walked and Abraham watched. Now this is extremely significant because of the message that God is sending to Abraham in this moment. And I need you to grab a hold of this message. 
because it has implications not just for Abraham, but it has implications for us as well. Essentially what God told Abraham in this moment is, I am taking full responsibility for this covenant. I'm taking responsibility. Essentially what God was communicating that God and God alone is the one who established this promise. Abraham did not get to negotiate the terms. Abraham did not have any requirements placed on him for fulfilling the covenant. God, not Abraham, walked between the carcasses. So that means that if Abraham or his descendants turned left or right or broke this eternal covenant, God alone would bear the punishment on his own shoulders because it was his promise and it's his life that's put on the line. You know what Abraham did? He believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Here's why this is important. Because God cut a covenant with Abraham and it's known as the Abrahamic covenant, but we live under a different covenant. As New Testament Christians, we live under what's known as a new covenant. The Old Testament is is called old, not because it happened in the past, but because it's underneath an old covenant. The New Testament, where we see Jesus, is called new because it's a new covenant that was cut with us. And so here's what I want you to know, and here's the implications that this has for our faith. You need to know that your covenant was cut on the cross. Your covenant was cut on the cross. I think God gives Abraham this picture, not just as a picture for him, but as a picture for what was to come in the future. God on that day, he understood what would happen with Jesus. He understood the road that Jesus would have to walk. God understood that he and he alone is establishing the promise. And even though Abraham comes up short, it was God who would pay the price for it. And even though under the new covenant, we come up short. Church, hear this. Even though you come up short, even though you question, even though you doubt, even though you waver in your faith, even though you have sinned time and time again, the punishment for the new covenant is not yours to bear. God told us that Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And guess what? He tells you the same thing under the new covenant. John 3, 16 It says, for God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but they would have eternal life. That you do not have to be given as the sacrifice. Your role is to believe in the sacrifice, believe that he walks death's pathway alone, and then through him, you will be credited as righteousness. And so here's the second thing you need to know. When you believe, your belief is counted as righteousness. When you believe in Jesus Christ and anybody who believes in Jesus Christ, they enter a new covenant with God. And they're no longer considered sinners. They are considered saints. Do you sin? Yes. Are you a sinner? Yes, but when God counts you among his people, he counts you as righteous. Now there's two ways to get your righteousness according to the new, the new covenant. You can walk death's pathway if you want to. You can choose to do that. You can stand arm in arm with God and say, God, I'm gonna try to be perfect. I'm never gonna turn to the left. I'm never gonna turn to the right and I'm gonna earn my righteousness. And some people try to do that. They try to convince God, I'm a good person. I'm a, I really haven't messed up. I'm not as bad as that person. And so God, I'm gonna walk through this under my own power. And can I tell you, God will let you do that. But he will also let you fulfill the consequences of the covenant when you mess up. And if you haven't already, can I let you know this? You will mess up. So there's a second better option under the new covenant. It's to watch Jesus and his life 
and his compassion and his heart and his teachings walk perfectly down death's walkway. And then to watch Jesus, who does not deserve the penalty of what these animals have experienced, take that penalty so that you don't have to, so that he can count you as righteous. Jesus isn't counting your serving. He's not counting your giving. He's not counting your acting. He's not counting your sins. He's not counting your doubts. When you cut a covenant with the Lord of all creations, he counts his son on your behalf and you receive his righteousness.